Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Tushinsky, and I'm the uh, Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. And I want to thank uh, those of you who are here on such a beautiful day. Um, uh, I think when we plan this event, it's always uh, uh, a bit of a danger, but you wouldn't think it would be so nice in Maine in, in October. But uh, I think people may actually start flowing in and out uh, for the rest of the day. So this is our uh, kind of the beginning of our uh, thorough bicentennial symposium. I'm not sure uh, there's anywhere else in the state that's really honoring the uh, thorough bicentennial. I know there are quite a few events that are happening all over the country. And uh, I think it's important to have one in this state, uh, given the importance of Thoreau to Maine and the importance of uh, Maine uh, to Thoreau. Um, I used to uh, teach a, a first year seminar on Thoreau and, and many of the students used to get uh, quite disenchanted with him wh when they kind of learned that Walden Pond was about a mile from the Emerson House and uh, you know they would come to me in class and you know is it true that his mother did his laundry? Uh, is it true that Mrs. Emerson made him Sunday dinners? And uh, some respects it is largely true, uh, and I think the students often had the expectation that Walden Pond was a, um, a wilderness experiment on the, along the lines of John Krakauer, that it was a, uh, a sort of a, a confrontation with, with, with raw nature. And, and what I often have the privilege of explaining to Maine students is that's what, in some respects, what Maine really represented to Thoreau. Uh, and yet, at the same time, when he arrived in Maine, uh, he was following uh, trails that had long been established by native peoples and, who are, and were already being carved out uh, by the lumber industry. So in many respects, the, the idea of wilderness that Thoreau confronted in Maine was really an imagined one. And uh, I uh, even sort of my know the first time I even visited, visited Maine was um, uh, to climb Mount Katahdin, and I, you know, carried a uh, a little copy of of Walden with me when I came here, and kind of started to have the realization that I couldn't even really experience nature or experience wilderness without experiencing it through the lens that had been kind of carved out by this generation of romantic uh, intellectuals. So, anyhow, you know, Maine is a both a physical place, but also a place of uh, the imagination. And so I'm, I'm very excited for the, the range of events we're having uh, to honor the Bicentennial today. And if you look at the back of your program, uh, there's going to be a, a film on campus. Uh, a prominent Maine documentarian, uh, Huey, uh, just produced a film on, on Thoreau. And then our uh, uh, Maine Museum of Photography is doing an um, exhibition of landscape photographs primarily that are, are uh, inspired by Thoreau. Um, so before we uh, introduce uh, Professor Gurr, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to many of the people who kind of helped put the range of these events together, most notably uh, USM staff Penny Glover and my co-convener uh, Libby Bischoff who is holding the door open right now downstairs and she'll be up soon and also the panelists are here and the panelists who will be coming and especially uh, Barry Rodrigue, who was a, uh, hist a humanities professor here at the University of Southern Maine and uh, was the principal organizer of this uh, event through July when he uh, took a job in India. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, he wanted to wish us uh, well. And if you have any uh, extra copies of transcendentalist literature, he's trying to, uh, what, what does Thoreau say? That he sort of drinks out of the Ganges in Walden. <laughs> uh, he's sort of bringing transcendentalism to South Asia, much like South Asian literature was processed through uh, Thoreau. Uh, anyhow, so uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, our keynote speaker today, I'm so excited to see again after so many years. Um, full disclosure, he was on my uh, dissertation committee. Um, which was important, but he was also uh, uh, fed us at a Mexican restaurant every uh, Wednesday night after seminar, which was uh, perhaps even more important than the dissertation defense. And uh, uh, he is uh, one of the most well-respected and well-known uh, historians of American literature and culture, both in the 19th century, 
and also the 17th century. Uh, he received his PhD uh, from uh, Harvard in 1977, taught at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, he moved to the University of North Carolina in 1987, uh, where he, in the year 2000, became the William S. Newman Distinguished Professor of American Literature and Culture. Uh, Professor Gura has, I uh, was sort of making fun of him last night uh, uh, about the amount that he publishes. Uh, it's almost too many publications to list. But I think what's most remarkable about his work is its intellectual range. Uh, he's published books on uh, early American literature and culture. Uh, one of the books that was on my comps list, for example, A, Gl A Glimpse of Science Glory, Puritan Radicalism in New England. He's published books on music history, including the banjo in the 19th century. He's also a banjo practitioner, as well as a scholar. Uh, he's also published books that have sort of straddled the line between uh, scholarly and uh, educated audiences, I would say. And most importantly, from my perspective, as someone who has taught the history of transcendentalism and, and have kind of struggled to synthesize it as a movement. Um, and I oddly, uh, it's a movement or a period in history that is often written solely through biography. And, and uh, in 2007, he published a, a uh, history of American uh, transcendentalism. And I think the, the sort of finest one volume work on the period as a whole. And one of the things that I think makes his work so remarkable in this respect is uh, obviously he's published a lot on Emerson Thoreau, the, the, the well-known figures, but uh, much like his latest book, um, uh, Romantic Reformers in the Coming of the Civil War, uh, he also writes on uh, less widely known figures um, like Orson Fowler or William Batchelor Green. And, uh, and so he has sort of managed to bring to life uh, a, a sort of a wider subset of American reformers and crackpots and dreamers and idealists. And uh, so uh, I'm so pleased to uh, have him up where he should be in, in New England. Uh, so thank you. It's a pleasure to be back here in uh, Portland this morning. I have many happy memories of this place uh, beginning about 20 years ago when Joseph Conforti, recently retired, had invited me to evaluate his uh, NEH grant on American regionalism. He had a wonderful program going between the University of Mississippi and this institution and uh, students from that campus visited here and people from here went there and we went along with them. So people learned uh, in Mississippi from, from Maine about barbecue and crawfish and, and people learned about clams up here. It was wonderful. And of course Adam, uh, I won't say much about that dissertation meeting but we'll, we, he did get through I uh, haven't been picked up by many deans in my life, but I had a ride from the airport yesterday with him, so I'm very proud of you, Adam. It's a particular pleasure to be here in October, uh, to see the fall foliage again. Uh, it reminded me of Richard Wilbur, uh, who died last week, as many of you know, at the age of 96, and particularly the poem he published in The New Yorker in 1960 called uh, October Maples in Portland. So I'm going to actually begin by reading a part of that. The leaves, though little time they have to live, were never so unfallen as today, and seemed to yield us through a rustled sieve the very light from which time fell away. A showered fire we thought forever lost redeems the air where friends in meeting pass. They parley in the tongues of Pentecost, gold ranks of temples flank the dazzled street. It's the light of maples, and we'll go, but not before it washes eye and brain with such a tincture such a sanguine glow as cannot fail to leave a lasting stain. It goes on for a bit more, but I thought I'd honor him by reading that. We're not here to discuss Wilbur, um, but Thoreau, the bicentennial of whose birth we celebrate this year. First, let me explain my title, uh, Thinking Through Thoreau, because the pun is intentional, uh, as his close friend William Ellery Channing remarked at one point, in everything he writes, there's a philological side. This needs to be carefully considered, Channing said. Thinking through Thoreau, as in pondering his life and career, and thinking through Thoreau, as in pondering what it means to consider for ourselves the lessons he offers. I've been thinking about him in both senses, <laughs> remarkably, for 50 years now. So first, I want to share parts of my long dialogue with him, and I do this 
not because I'm self-centered enough to think that my experiences are somehow special. Rather, I hope that you might find them emblematic of how great writing continues to be important to us, even when electronic media have so taken over our lives. Now more than ever, we need the guidance of great minds who are not blind to the complexity of the moment and show us the truth without mincing words. And who better to speak of the perils and joys of a brave new world than a man who encountered similar challenges as the first industrial revolution irrevocably changed his life, just as the computer revolution has changed ours. I came to him in middle school, and I can date my epiphany fairly accurately. I was barely a teenager in a November that stands out from all other damp, drizzly Novembers by the horror of gunshots in Dallas. One afternoon, aside a field of unharvested hay, I saw a choke cherry tree full of chattering yellow birds. Only as large as robins, in their aura they seemed immense, surreal, black on their wings and with oversized finched bills working their way through fermenting fruit with such dispatch that I watched the ground chalk beneath with their droppings. I'd walked the woods enough even then to know that twice as big and amazingly bright, these were not goldfinches. Against a crystalline autumn sky, these birds were garish, so noisy as to be brash and unforgettable, when five minutes later, as oblivious to me as I was entranced by them, they flew and that last cherry was gone. Harbinger of all other birds that I would see, this visitation transformed my life as completely as though, as the 17th century philosopher John Locke would put it, I had encountered a new simple idea. It changed everything. But I didn't know what they were. And when I discovered that my small town library had no book on the shelf that pictured them, with the librarian's help, I set about compiling a list of natural history museums whose scientists I was convinced would eagerly want to know about my discovery. As a 12-year-old, I sent off handwritten letters to each addressed to the curator of birds. They didn't know their names. Months passed without answer, but one day, as mysteriously as the birds themselves, there appeared in the mailbox a letter from the Museum of Natural History in New York City, a few lines hastily penned by the curator of ornithology, undoubtedly Evening Grosbeaks, a large cousin of the goldfinch, signed Dean Amidon. My next trip to the library yielded Roger Peterson's field guide, serendipitously returned by whoever had checked it out prior to my first foray. And there were my birds, the evening grosbeaks. Their visit was not the remarkable thing it turned out, for in severe winters they often wandered from northern forests to feed in New England. Rather, as I subsequently learned, what was remarkable was that one of the world's foremost ornithologists had taken the time to answer a schoolboy's scrawl. That note was the beginning of it all for me. From that point, birds continued to bring surprises and in marvelous ways. In the winter of the Grosbeaks, for example, the backyard feeder was even more unusual, if not quite as striking, with visitors from the far north, Acadian, or as they were called back then, boreal chickadees. And a few days later, I mentioned them to a friend's father because in his living room I had seen some pictures of birds. As I expected, this man knew something about them and told me that my chickadees were rare. They stayed all winter long, eating suet, peanut butter, even ripe bananas. Sensing my growing interest as spring approached, this generous man began to take his own son, another neighbor, about my age, and me on bird walks throughout the area. He talked about yard lists, year lists, life lists, and how to record my sightings. He allowed me to pour through field records of his from 15 years earlier, in which I eagerly read of species, many of which had become rare, that he had seen in places where we still walked. He taught me bird song, so much so and so well that within a year there would be mornings when before daylight we noted 40 species without having seen one bird. Now, half a century later, coming upon some obscure warbler, I not only can still identify it, but can recall where I first heard its song. He loaned me books from his naturalist library, books in which I read about rare species that I had never seen, books, of course, that included a set of Thoreau's journals in the turn of the century Riverside edition. At this friend's suggestion, and with Thoreau as my inspiration, I filled notebooks with my daily records of this species. And each Sunday, I sent to Samuel Atkins Elliott, Jr., a Smith College professor of English and the dean of birders in the Connecticut Valley, a weekly digest of what birds I had seen and where and when. 
By return mail, I would learn from a postcard or letter in a tiny, precise hand what he and scores of others had found and how my sightings related to those. I still have these missives, years of them, bundled with elastic bands, communication between a retired professor, his grandfather was the great Charles William Eliot, president of Harvard, bundled with elastic bands, communication between a retired professor and a teenager who didn't even know what a seven sister college was, earnest of a man's compulsive desire to know all that he could of the birds of Western Massachusetts. He was, I realize, one of my first inspirational teachers. I remember such things, evening grosbeaks, brown capped chickadees, a rare Lawrence's warbler, two goshawks defending their nest, and the people with whom I saw or shared news of them because for a decade, such things were what mattered most to me. Day by day, I grew bird by bird, that which would become unmistakably and indelibly me, already encoded in hundreds of unique and yet absolutely quotidian experiences. These winged creatures allowed me to know by the age of 16 things few others ever would. To see, for example, in the stillness beyond time, 15 feet away, the bright yellow eye of a bald eagle, or at twilight to hear, 100 feet above the alder thickets, the woodcock in remarkable courtship flight. In such things, it was as though, as Melville put it, I could see God's foot upon the treadle of the loom. I soon realized that such obsessive bird chasing and record keeping set me apart, <laughs> needless to say, from other adolescents. But through my immersion in nature, I grew, as Thoreau himself said, like corn in the night. Indeed, birds took me first unawares, from the thoughts of the killing fields in Southeast Asia or the riots in Watts to my own special places, the tidal flats of Monomoy Island, the high ridges of Mount Greylock at the opposite end of Massachusetts, Plum Island salt meadows, Cape Ann's granite outcroppings, to great meadows, well fleet, and other wildlife refuges, and more than anywhere else, for a few years almost daily, to the pristine Quabbin Reservoir watershed whose immense waters served as metropolitan Boston's drinking supply. Here, on thousands of well-protected acres, four miles from my home, wildlife lived as it did in the 19th century. There, in all weather and in all seasons, my father, a laborer who did not finish high school, and I spent the countless hours of my waxing in his waning, adding to our lists. I came to believe, as Thora did, in the forest and in the meadow and in the night in which the corn grows, and all of this at the expense of my Catholic upbringing. But most importantly, birds took me, as I just said, to Thoreau, whose journals I had sampled at my older friend's home and to whom I now turned for wisdom, caught as I was with millions of others in the turmoil that was the 1960s. I had realized soon enough that the insatiable listing that so occupied my time proved inadequate, finally, to the depth of my experiences, and so too the cryptic notes I sent to Sam Elliott. What I was learning of the world required different tools to measure and a different language to market, and these I found as serendipitously as I had stumbled upon the evening grosbeaks. When a junior high teacher, trying to keep a precocious student from boredom one day, suggested that if I liked nature so much, I should read Walden, I leaped at the opportunity. In the lovingly wrought description of Thora's life in the woods around Concord, I found mirrored my own deepening relationship to nature. Do not underestimate the value of a fact, he had written. It may one day flower in a truth. To see a fact flower into a truth was an ambition particularly suited to the flower power youth of the late 1960s. But rather than becoming an out and out hippie, I tried to affect my magical mystery tours through the ritual of walking and journal keeping that Thoreau had perfected. What are you doing now? Emerson had asked. Do you keep a journal? So I make my first entry today, Thoreau wrote. And thus began the composition of what became like Emerson's, a life's work. And so, too, I cited this very passage as I wrote my first words. Every evening, laden with the potluck of the day, birds, people, events, books, poems, quotations, I visited my journal's blank pages, and an hour later left them filled with what I came to view as an organic extension of myself. Like chasing birds from dawn to dusk, the journal keeping eventually became obsessive. And while not left behind for 15 years, eventually became less and less identified in my mind exclusively with Thoreau. But his significance never diminished, for I eventually discovered that he wrote so movingly about nature because he understood society so well. In other words, I finally found the Thoreau of civil disobedience and life without principle, 
and return to the first two chapters of Walden, he whose pithy sentences suddenly began in the turmoil of the 60s to grace everything from Sierra Club posters to flyers for next week's anti-war rally. To a generation disgusted with the seemingly universal complicity and evil of any who supported what they call the military-industrial complex, Thoreau offered heady and restorative tonic. Permit me one more reminiscence before I turn to more substantive matters about him. I was ending my freshman year in college. I'd seen my classmates dragged off by state police for occupying university property to pr protest the presence of ROTC. I'd run through tear gas in the streets outside of my dorm. It was all very exciting to a country boy. But I also had to grapple with things close at home, like choosing a field of study. I had decided to apply to a special major called History and Literature. And to enter this program, I had to be interviewed. I had to declare an area or country of interest, and I wanted to do French history and literature. I had been, like many others for that period, entranced by Camus, Sartre, Gide, and these French writers. But to my chagrin, the interviewer said there were no more places left in the French history and literature program. We kept talking. He asked me what else I was interested in. I mentioned nature and birds and my affection for Thoreau. His response, another of those amazingly significant turning points, was, why not major in American history and literature? The very field in which he specialized. And the he uh, is the very eminent Richard Rabinowitz, the museum uh, designer who did all the major programs at the New York Historical Society of the last 10 years, the slavery in New York and things like that. He became an independent historian. He was the one who was the uh, interviewer. Before I left the room, I was a convert and my scholarly and intellectual life subsequently unfolded pedal after pedal, article after article, book after book. It really was a moment of grace when I left the room from the interview. And so I went on to study exactly what uh, uh, Adam said I did, American history and literature, specifically from the period of the land's initial exploration by white Europeans through the 19th century. But it all started with Thoreau, on whom I did a major part of my dissertation, and on whom I've continued to write after all these years. Indeed, I published my first essay on him as a graduate student, hard to believe, in 1975. Why? What, it, what is the nature of the continuing attraction? Let me try to tell you with reference to one of his lesser known books, not The Maine Woods, but Cape Cod. I realize that this may seem like an odd choice given that this conference celebrates Thoreau in Maine, but you're gonna be hearing much about that. And your being here in Portland on the sea makes me think it might be salutary for you to think about the ocean rather than his mountain book. You know, he wrote uh, one river book, Week on the Concord Merrimack Rivers, one pond book, Walden, of course, and one book about the sea, Cape Cod. Cape Cod is a work that I've come to love and appreciate as a compliment to his more famous Walden and one which treats a topic, the ocean and the shore, particularly close to the hearts of so many of you here. Cape Cod has at its center Thoreau's encounters with another form of the wilderness he so movingly describes in the penultimate chapter of Walden when he, need, when he speaks of the need man has to witness his own limits transgressed. Man can never have enough of nature, he observes, and must be refreshed by the sight of inexhaustible vigor. Vast, titanic features, the seacoast with its wrecks, the wilderness with its living and decaying trees, the thundercloud and the rain which lasts three weeks and produces freshets. A particularly resonant phrase, given our country's recent experience with floods. But he knew too uh, that nature need not be extravagant to move one with its power. He, of course, had seen, as he put it, the wilderness with its living and its decaying trees on his trips to Maine. And on Mount Katahdin, as some of you know, he was absolutely terrified. For there he wrote, vast, titanic, inhuman nature had got him at a disadvantage, caught him alone and pilfered him of some of his divine faculty. So it was at Walden Pond he found, as Emerson had counseled in his seminal little book, Nature, the miraculous in the simple. He had, as he put it, traveled much in Concord. But Thoreau occasionally yearned for deeper drafts of that tonic of wildness he had tasted in Maine and at different times in his own neighborhood. Not given to complacency, he relished the opportunity to front the immense fact of nature in all the variety and to gauge its effect on him. Moreover, in the 1850s, such encounters did not require elaborate preparation or far distant travel, even to the main rivers and lakes. He could take a train 
from Boston to Sandwich on Cape Cod and meet the wild face to face, or he could take a ferry from Boston, Provincetown, um, and meet, meet the wild face to face, in this case where the land ran up against the Atlantic Ocean on the outer arm of Massachusetts. He visited the Cape four times between 1849 and 57. He placed a few essays about these visits in magazines, but the book that we know as Cape Cod did not appear until 1864, the year after his death, or two years after his death, prepared for press by his sister Sophia and his friend and walking companion, William Ellery Channing, whom I quoted earlier. Having already used a similar format in his week on the Concord Merrimack Rivers, he assembled his account of Cape Cod as a travelogue, the popular genre, and grafted material from his subsequent trips onto the original excursion he had taken in 1849. A pair of hikers, Channing and he, had traveled by foot along the entire great beach, the side of the Cape fronting the Atlantic, to Provincetown. They returned to Boston by steamer across Massachusetts Bay. And as one would expect in such a travel book, there was much talk of the land and sand and sea. But what most engages his imagination is the way in which the immense fact of the ocean constantly impinges on the lives of the Cape's inhabitants, how nature, lest we forget it, surrounds us and determines all aspects of our lives, even we think that through our technology we control it. In other words, Thoreau's trip to Cape Cod allowed him further insight into the complexity of man and nature that always occupied him. But the reader does well to understand that, unlike what one comes to expect from Walden, where the spiritual knowledge gained through nature is restorative, here it often is unsettling. His grisly first chapter, The Shipwreck, quickly demonstrates this, for in painstaking and painful detail, he describes wandering amidst the wreckage of a brig bound from Ireland to the New World, most of its immigrant passengers drowned within sight of what they believed their new land of opportunity. The sea's sheer indifference to man numbed Thoreau. He described, for example, the many marbled feet and matted heads as the cloths were raised and one livid, swollen, and mangled body of a drowned girl who probably, as he put it, had intended to go out to service in some American family. But finally, he learned the lesson that he repeats frequently in the course of his narrative. People who live close to the sea must not expect any favors from nature and thus must accept its raw, inhuman power without sentimentality. Watching some townspeople raking and picking seaweed that the storm had tossed ashore, he marveled at their seeming callousness to the tragedy at arm's length. Drown who might, he observes, they did not forget that this weed was a valuable manure and had to get on with their lives. Simply put, the shipwreck, he wrote, had not produced a visible vibration in the fabric of society just as it had not affected the majesty of the sea itself. Thoreau quickly drew the lesson. If this was the law of nature, why waste any time in awe or pity? Amidst all the talk of explorers, fishermen, and the harsh, impoverished landscape of the Cape, always we hear this refrain, like the sound of the breakers themselves. For Thoreau, the seashore became a, a sort of neutral ground, he wrote, a most advantageous place from which to view the world, but a place different from the dreamy, moonlit room his conquered neighbor Nathaniel Hawthorne described in virtually the same words, a neutral territory, and in which he found the atmosphere conducive to writing the Scarlet Letter. Such internalized realms of the imagination that entranced his conquered friend did little for Thoreau. True to his experience at Walden, he sought, as he put it, to front only the essential facts of life, and on the great Atlantic beach, front them he did. There, everything that he encountered, he wrote tersely, told of the sea. And while the landlubber might think that the ocean is but a larger lake, as civil now as a city's harbor, a place for ships and commerce, it was incumbent on us to recognize that it could quickly be, quote, dashed into a sudden fury. This gentle ocean will toss and tear the rag of a man's body like the father of mad bulls, he wrote, just as a river forced its channel, forced from its channel by rain, will reclaim the floodplain around it. Thus, the ocean was simply uh, more than a larger and deeper Walden Pond. The people whom he encountered on Cape Cod, the well-fleet oystermen, the keeper of the Highland Light, the men and boys who sailed from Provincetown Harbor in the mackerel fleet, all could read the immense landscape of the region, a literacy that Thoreau came to admire and eventually to emulate. From an outsider's perspective, the Cape Codders and their compatriots were rough, crude people, 
and their domiciles like the shacks built along the beach for the safety of storm-wrecked sailors as spartan and salty as the native speech. Yet Thoreau realized that they survived in this harsh and weather-beaten landscape because they learned how to make do. To take, as Emerson put it so memorably in his essay, Experience, the potluck of the day and to make a meal of it. They lived every day with only the bare necessities of life, as Thoreau wished to do, and as he had done for a while at Walden. In return, they were given frequent glimpses at least as deep into the world's mysteries. Writing of the wreck masters appointed by a town to oversee the disposition of property washed up after storms, he wrote wryly, but are we not all wreckers contriving that some treasure may be washed up on our beach that we may secure it? A main thread in his book, then, is the finding and, uh, uh, and recognizing the treasure in the flotsam and jetsam of our lives, of knowing the difference between appearance and reality, a skill acquired by the Cape Codders as they acknowledged that over much of life they simply had no control. He noted the shimmering mirages raised by the sun over sand and water, a deception of the senses when one is confronted with the simplest object on the beach. At a distance, for example, a few bones in the sand look like the entire, for the entire world like beach spars. And such hallucinations figured the larger cipher of the ocean, which skewed all attempts to know it, and by implication of the universe itself. Thus looking one day at the numerous vessels of the fishing fleet in open water and realizing that, as he wrote, as far as they were distant from us, so were they from one another, Thoreau and his companion were deeply moved by a sense of the immensity of the ocean and what proportion man and his works bear to the globe. The longer and farther they looked, the water grew darker and darker and deeper and deeper till it was, he said, awful to consider. He had, ventured, he had measured the depth of Walden and, and wrote about it in his uh, book, but he wrote here, of what use is the bottom of the ocean? if it is out of sight, if it is two or three miles from the surface and you are drowned so long before you get to it. Before we refinish Cape Cod, we realize that for Thoreau, such questions, however unsettling, when we first uh, phrase them, finally have become rhetorical. Such bottoms indeed have their use, if only to teach us our place in nature. I did not intend this for a sentimental journey, he wrote, for this was no common guidebook. He understood his trips to Cape Cod as nothing less than journeys of exploration in a literal sense, as he linked himself through so many of his asides to those Europeans who had seen the same shore and in a metaphorical sense represented so beautifully in the conclusion to Walden as he meditated on the importance of exploring, as he put it, one's own higher latitudes. On one level, for example, he delights to think that his experiences are comparable to those of the early explorers, as when he ate a large clam by cooking it in its shell, only to find uh, it uh, a severe emetic. He improved the gastronomic lesson through his discovery of a comparable moment in Mort's relation of the Plymouth Colony's first years. It brought me nearer to the pilgrims, he wryly observed, to be thus reminded by a similar experience that I was so much like them. Yet he also sought to understand what initially had possessed great travelers to take the risks they did, and concluded that it had to do with their willingness to take their own measure as well as that of the world around them. Via Columbus, he wrote in the conclusion to Walden, to hold new continents and worlds within you, opening new channels, not of trade, but of thought. Explore the private sea, he said, the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean of one's being alone for that is where the true discoveries are made. On Cape Cod, he was alone with himself, just as he was in the Maine woods or in his hut at Walden Pond, or as we can be on the Outer Banks or on Mount Mitchell or in Maine's wilderness. In such places, one comes face to face with that which makes us reconsider the complacency in which most people live, just as we have had to do after the hurricanes that have so devastated our country in recent years. The ocean is a wilderness reaching around the globe, he wrote, wilder than a Bengal jungle, fuller of monsters, washing the very wharves of our cities and the gardens of our seaside residences, and too few of them knew it. But just as he had traveled much in Concord, had taken himself and his readers to new levels of experience, so on Cape Cod, a mere 50 miles from Concord, he would do it again in a different but similarly accessible landscape. In Cape Cod, then, we learn that the first region, region's first explorers and present inhabitants made Thoreau understand more of the mystery of his own relationship to the natural world and, by extension, to the eternity it shadows. 
Here we might consider how Cape Cod fits the contours of those higher laws that Thoreau had glimpsed in the Walden Pond years. For despite our tendency to associate him with the tenets of transcendentalism, in Walden and in other works from the 1850s, Thoreau moved toward a very different understanding of the universe than that suggested by his contemporaries, even the most radical among them. I think particularly of the striking passage toward the conclusion of Walden's second chapter, when he announces, God himself culminates in the present moment and will never be more divine in the lapse of all the ages. And we are enabled to apprehend at all what is sublime and noble, he continues, only by the perpetual instilling and drenching of the reality which surrounds us. At times like this, it seems to me, Thoreau ceases to be a transcendentalist. That is, he clearly tells us that a desire to transcend reality, to move, as Emerson urged, through nature to spirit, is fatuous. Nature is not to be used, as Emerson in his book of that title suggested, as a ladder on which to move to some higher consciousness. Rather, acceptance of nature, drenching ourselves in the reality around us until we realize, as he wrote, that shams and delusions are esteemed for soundest truths, while reality is fabulous is the sane way to view the world. Here then is a past part two to Thoreau's mature writings. For once we recognize the true radicalism of his vision, which we might best call uh, that of a naturist, we begin to see how much of what he writes seemingly has figuration and that he means it literally. Consider, for example, when in the spring chapter of Walden, he peers into the messy railroad cut through which men have laid rails for the iron beast. He observes that he was as affected as if in a peculiar sense I stood in the laboratory of the artist who made the world, had come to where he was still at work, sporting on this bank, and with excess of energy strewing his fresh designs about. The rawness of Thoreau's sentiment, this view into the earth, had suggested, among other things, at least nature has some bowels, and there again is mother of humanity, only increases a few pages later. There he notes, we should be cheered when we observe the vulture feeding on the carrion, which disgusts and disheartens us, and deriving health from his repast. Even the overpowering stench from a dead horse in his path only serves to remind him of the strong appetite and inviolable health of nature. Truly to know the world, to know it as a thorough rather than as an Emerson would, is to see it red in tooth and claw. It also is to marvel, as he put it, that, life is so, uh, that it is so rife with life that myriad can be afforded to be sacrificed and suffered to prey on one another without any harm to its overall health. The impression made by nature on a wise man, he wrote, is that of universal innocence. Such passages in Thoreau's great work provide the larger framework for appreciating the achievement of Cape Cod, for therein too we come to learn, albeit in different ways, that poison is not poisonous after all, nor are any wounds fatal. To speak otherwise is to be merely sentimental. Thus, as he puts it when he explains why he had so t was so taken with the idea of walking up the cape, in that way he said, I had got the cape under me as if I were riding it barebacked. It was not as it is on the map, he wrote, or seen from the stagecoach, but there I found it all out of doors, huge and real, Cape Cod. It cannot be represented on a map, color it as you will, the thing itself than which there is nothing more like it, no truer picture or account which you cannot go further and see. Of course, those so inclined might observe <clears throat> that at one level this passage is about the desire for representation and how it is seemingly always doomed to failure. But it also is much, if not more, about his wish to push against the divine envelope in which we live by drenching himself in the reality that surrounded him, to know, know something firsthand, not to know it through someone else's words or maps. What then did he go to the Cape to see? The ocean is a wild, rank place, he tells us, and there's no flattery in it. Strewn with crabs, horseshoes, razor clams, and whatever the sea casts up, a vast morgue it is with the carcasses of men's and beasts together, rotting and bleaching in the sun and waves, and each tide turning them over in their beds. There on the great beach is naked nature, he concludes, inhumanly sincere, wasting no thought on man. Such knowledge and assurance were the choicest fruit of Thoreau's peripatetic exploration of Cape Cod. 
Amid all the talk of mackerel fishing and hard scrabble farming and the trenchant observations on the manners and mores of the inhabitants, the detailed descriptions of flora and fauna and the antiquarian lore gathered from the town histories and gazetteers, always there was the stark fact of the Atlantic, as profound in its way as Walden Pond. The reader must not forget that the dash and roar of the waves were incessant, he observes, and thus it would be well if he were to read my book with a large conch shell at his ear. He takes pains to remind us that what we hear therein might be as unsettling as the stench of carrion, yet finally as indicative of nature's bounty and health. In that shell, as in Cape Cod, Thoreau wants us to hear nothing less than the sound of our own mortality, and he asks us first to accept that knowledge and then to find joy in it, understanding that we are a part, not apart from nature. Toward such worlds of knowledge, then, Thoreau explored the sands of Cape Cod, and to claim such wisdom, he wished to associate the ocean until it lost the pond-like look which it wears to a countryman. In Walden, he had presented his deepest understanding of the natural world through the frequently invoked imagery of the cycle of the seasons. But in Cape Cod, such imagery is replaced, fittingly, with that of the cyclical tides, their steady patterns affecting us as powerfully as the pulse of our own heartbeats. In Walden, we learn, as Thoreau did, that nature's variety, indeed its very vitality, is to be understood through the inevitable return of spring, so beautifully evoked in the chapter of that same name. But in Cape Cod, nature is reduced further to its lowest terms, to its hourly pulsations. There, as he wrote famously in Walden, one could front only the essential facts of life, and he wanted to see if he could not learn what it had to teach, and not when he came to die, discover that he had not lived. If you stand right fronting and face to face to a fact, you will see the sun glimmer on its surfaces, he continued, as if it were a scimitar, and feel its sweet edge dividing you through heart and marrow. Such was the painfully sweet knowledge he sought and found on Cape Cod, as in other places commensurate to his capacity for wonder. Cape Cod cannot ever replace Walden, but it can stand fittingly next to it as another testament to Thoreau's commitment to no man's place in nature and thus to know himself. Always honest, sometimes to a fault, to Emerson's observation that to study nature and to know oneself are the same thing, he took from such scrutiny the hard knowledge that this life is all that we have. In any weather, he wrote, I've been anxious to improve the nick of time, to notch it on my stick to, to stand on the meeting of two eternities, the past and the future, which is precisely the present moment, and to tow that line. That he was able, in spite of such knowledge, to fill the world with such beauty, and further was able to convey that beauty so memorably in his prose, marks Thoreau as one of America's treasures. What are springs and waterfalls, he asked rhetorically at Cape Cod's conclusion. Here is the spring of springs, the waterfall of waterfalls. A man may stand there and put all America behind him, for the Cape was a place from which one could see one's origins, and thus where he was at home and come to know that place for the first time. Limbed in various essays at the height of what historians call the Transcendentalist period, but published at the end of the Civil War, Cape Cod offers an important clue as to how Thoreau viewed the carnage perpetrated by his countrymen. Like Whitman's Drum Taps, written by another so-called transcendentalist, Cape Cod finally is a book for the realist's shelf. Thank you for indulging this ungainly mixture of appreciation and literary evaluation. Among other things, I've tried to show you how an author stays with one, even as one grows and develops in new ways over half a century. Fifty years ago, as a budding naturalist, I started reading Thoreau. Fifty years later, as an academic, I still read him for the aesthetic pleasure he provides, but more for the deep wisdom about the place of man in nature. This is the lesson I wish to bring home to you, that he remains a living presence to us, someone to whom we can turn to keep our company or to write our moral keel. For when we read a really great book, we associate ourselves with a mind that can only clarify and improve our own usually limited views. Such books are both mirrors that reflect us and windows through which we can see further. We become more, we understand more, and we appreciate more than we ever could before. Who would have thought that all this could come of my one day having taken the time to stop and watch a tree full of yellow bright birds? May our own lives be filled with such moments and such books as I find. Thoreau would want it that way.
And remember one last thing that he wrote, life is like a stroll upon the beach as near the ocean's edge as we can go. Thank you. Let me, let me elaborate a few things and then uh, sure. take some questions. Yes, that would be great. Uh, this, this is about my deep sense, as I said a few minutes ago, that, um, excuse me, that we really do him a disservice to, to always claim that he's Emerson's disciple, because I think really in these later works, he's coming to see the world in a very different way. And that very last thing I said about the, the Cape Cod essays perhaps reflecting his own sense of the of the horror and disaster in the Civil War years. He, he died just after it started, but he, he certainly read the early reports. Uh, seems to suggest that if he had lived, he would have become a very different and distinguish himself much more from the Emerson uh, about whom we think and write. So that's part of the argument I was trying to make in the, uh, in the story. But also uh, this sense uh, of, of the, the kind of magic or reality of every moment being drenched, drenched in reality. I love that word. It's like he's standing. It's not raining, though. Reality is coming down on him instead of the rain falling falling upon him, uh, sort of standing in a swamp looking for an orchid, something like that, is, is your picture of what he wants to experience. That's different from Emerson. Uh, Emerson is much more cerebral, uh, and I don't think would be comfortable with the kinds of ideas that Thoreau was m moving toward in, in the later part of his life. So anyway, I find uh, that when I was thinking about this, that it might be fun for you to think about the ocean instead of Mount Katahdin all the time with, uh, with, with Thoreau in, in Maine. But I'd be glad to uh, answer questions that you have about what I said or hear comments about it. Yes, sir. Well, I'm interested in, as a, in your experience as a teacher dealing with students today, uh, in terms of uh, how drenched they are in reality, <laughs> uh, or drenched in what can be termed artificiality, uh, the virtual world which seems to have overtaken so many people, not just students, but many adults too. What struck me most coming into the room was that poster back there. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's what to do if there's an active shooter in the room. <laughs> I hope there's an inactive one. For <laughs> I, I hope there's an inactive shooter in the room. <laughs> I don't think we have to worry. Crime has been going down in America. This is probably the safest state in the country. Uh, so what that represents to me is uh, a lack of reality the sense of artificiality that comes through the media, which people are drenched in in so many different ways. So what do you see? I'm just curious about your personal... Well, I'll tell you, uh, one anecdote comes to mind. I've, I've mentioned to a few people. I, I get my mail at the, excuse, I get my mail at, the, at the post office, which is across from the campus. So I walk through the campus every day. For 30 years, I walk that walk. And uh, it, barred owls live in the trees. You know, there are all kinds of birds singing, uh, squirrels everywhere. And uh, uh, people would walk there 10, 15 years ago, be, be talking, going to class, and now every single person has earbuds in, even if they're walking together. They, they, they're listening and going away. So I'm, I'm just thinking, not only are they not hearing these things that, that are all around them, they're not even communicating with each other in that way. So I, you know, I certainly second what you're, what you're saying. On the other hand, um, I find that uh, if I talk about Thoreau in these ways, um, some of them get it. It isn't, you know, it isn't his bailing out of society so much anymore. That, that's how it was in the 70s when I began teaching him. Uh, people were interested in his criticism of, of, uh, of the American way, the American economy, of course, the Vietnam War. But once Reagan came in, the 80s and, and into the 90s, um, the students found him, you know, too cranky, too ornery, unrealistic, you know, who would want to do that now? Um, but I think really with the, with the growth of the environmental movement, with the growth of a different kind of consciousness about global warming and things, the kinds of things I was mentioning here actually are, they do get through to some of them when you teach Walden, which is usually what I teach to the undergraduates. Um, so I'm not, in, I'm not in as much despair as I was, let's say, 25 years ago when I thought that he really wouldn't be appreciated in that way. But I agree with you totally about, you know, our inability to distinguish what's real any longer. I'll tell you a, another great moment I had uh, to show you the miracle in the moment. Uh, a friend of mine gave me a few Luna moth caterpillars. And he said, this is the kind of tree it grows on. Why don't you grow these things? And I said, what's going to happen to them? He said, well, they're going to eat these leaves every day. They're going to poop out this stuff. You clean it out. And then one day, the, 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 the caterpillar's going to go in a leaf, 
and begins spinning a cocoon around itself in its leaf. Well, I didn't believe him, of course, I wasn't going to see him. And so I took and, and I, I came home once, and, and from my jar, I kept hearing a noise. And I couldn't figure it out. And I lifted the jar up, and inside a leaf was this shuddering, this, this movement, and he was spinning his silk around himself in that thing. I mean, you know, I've, I've observed things for years and years. I thought this was simply amazing, right? And within half a day, it was totally enmeshed in that. Uh, what, what kids stop to see that kind of thing these days? How many of us take, take the, you know, the, the, these things are happening right outside in, in different ways. So, you know, Walden sometimes awakens them to the fact that there are beautiful things and the simplicity around them. And that's, you know, again, one of the treasures I think that he brings to us. So. Anyway, and the, the other part of the story is, so then it's there, it's in its cocoon. And I came home one night, I had left it outside. It was still fairly warm. Uh, and, and I kept hearing this rattling as I was opening the door, and I thought a moth was stuck in my window and all this. And I look, and there's nothing there. And I look in the jar, and there is the green luna moth. It had come out and it was flapping to get out. So I actually saw both ends of the, the metamorphosis, so to speak. It was really quite remarkable. Uh, anyway, I saw another hand a minute ago. I thought I did. Other questions? Yes? I have two questions. Sure. One is for students in the room, of which there are some, we all are, really. Um, in listening to you read your piece, I was taken with how seamless it is and yet how clear, through long experience, that your voice enters, the world's voice enters, and it's fluid back and forth. And one of the things we talk about a lot in teaching, teaching writing, teaching literature for students' perspective is, is how how challenging and difficult that can sometimes be to write in response, how to bring someone else's words into your own sentence, your own paragraph, your own page. How to do that, um, especially if someone's words are so unlike your own, if we have text to speak and you're writing about the road. So I would be just grateful for all of us students in the room, any kind of <laughs> over long experience of doing that and well, I mean, you've kind of put your finger on something. I mean, I'm kind of saturated with him. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was trying to express at the beginning. I mean, of all the writers, I've lived with him the longest. Uh, I, I could never do that seamlessly with Melville, whom I love to read and teach, but I couldn't, couldn't give a paper like this using his language and, and have my words move into his because it's so different and dramatic. So... Um, I don't know. I th I'd sim simply say that, uh, well, you, you, obviously f you obviously know this means something to me. So, you know, you have to have some sort of feeling about the language, some kind of feeling that, you know, that, that it's saying something to you that you want to somehow incorporate into your own comments about the writer or the book that he's, he's portraying. But um, I don't know. I, I just, it, like I say, he comes naturally to me right now. He comes naturally. What was your other question? Oh, my other question is, I don't know if it's more straightforward or less. Throw on verbs. Yeah, there's a lovely little book that came out, I think, in the 70s or so, where someone exerted from his journals all of the uh, observations on, on bird life. And of course, back then, of course, he, he, uh, most people were still shooting them to identify them, although the great ornithologists of the 1840s and 50s were collectors, and, and their, you know, their birds now are in the Museum of Comparative Zoology in Cambridge or places like that, uh, or where Dean Abaddon's are in, in New York City. Uh, war, rather. Uh, and even into the 1940s and 50s in Massachusetts, if you saw a rare bird, uh, let's say uh, uh, a bird not native, or, or rather that was an accidental, as they call it, uh, so the great birders had a, a permit to shoot it, so they could collect it for one of these museums. But my point is that he, he was still working pretty much maybe with a, a small scope at the most, but without binoculars and without gun. So sometimes he didn't get, he didn't get things fully right, but he, he certainly, what he knew most about was botany. And there have been one or two books recently about, someone did a wonderful book about Concord now and the difference in the botany of what's there and what was there in the 1840s and 50s, as one can pick from his journals and things. So uh, the journals remain a wonderful source for all kind of, of a sort of historical study of these, of these creatures. Um, but uh, but birds, birds certainly were a passion of his as well, yeah. And of course, m most of the larger animals, mammals, had been... Uh, 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 really extinguished from the area. He, he, he wasn't even seeing deer and things in Concord in the 1840s and 50s. We see deer everywhere now where we live. Um, other thoughts? Anyone want to? 
I was wondering if I could jump in with yeah, a question, sure. if that's okay. I, you, your sort of a career is, is, is somewhat distinct. It, it almost feels uh, like uh, academic uh, life now has become so specialized and most <laughs> academics are kind of churning out monographs and ever narrower subjects. And as a historian, uh, we, we sort of rarely even venture, an American historian, rarely venture out of a decade or, or, or a generation. And, and you, your work has been so broad in terms of time, but also discipline, you kind of range and out of disciplines. And, you know, this piece, in some respects, argues like that unlike Emerson, that he doesn't use nature as a ladder, but becomes fully immersed into nature. And yet, in my sense of Thoreau has been, in some respects, like, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in uh, Lisa Grass, uh, Whitman, kind of experiences like the urban crowd, I think he says, with uh, like a side curve head, and he's both in and outside of the game, and sort of watching it, and then also reflecting upon it. And it's always been kind of my sense that, and as you refer to the, the period that he was writing in, that, that Thoreau was the, the first person to experience nature, the, or the most important person to experience nature in, in the way that we experience it now, where it is, uh, you're sort of outside it, immerse yourself into it and experience it almost therapeutically, or like a middle class person. But is your take on Thoreau that in some respects that he was able to sort of go beyond that or uh, well, particularly in the 1850s? Or? Let me go back to one line here, because um, I want to explain it. I should find it. Uh, it's the line about um, poison is not poisonous, nor are any wounds fatal. Remember that line? And I, and I said that, that he went beyond that kind of sentimentality. W w w a, a chipmunk or a, or a whale or, or a, a, you know, a fish um, doesn't think about itself that way. He doesn't think, oh, I ate a poison, I'm going to die, or oh, I've been hit by a sword, I'm going to lose, lose myself now. And I think what, when he's describing that, he's talking about how everything he sees in the natural world, everything that we call terrible, oh, it's fatal, oh, don't eat it, it's poison. These kinds of things have been put there by, by men, by, by, by people, that, that we've impressed this kind of thing on nature. But really, any wound is fatal. I mean, and not fatal, we're all going to be fatal. We're all going to die at some point. So he said, why do we have to identify with these kinds of actions or these kinds of words? So to do that is, is a kind of uh, backing away from the reality he saw of the violence, the, the sort of give and take of the constant uh, power of nature to control our lives. So I, I really see him, you know, again, in that sense, too, quite, quite remarkable and, and very modern in that sense, too. I mean, I, I know what you're saying about some of us find nature, quote, therapeutic. But, uh, but the point, of course, of, of Walden is that he saw that wildness even at Walden Pond a mile from Emerson's house. You know, he saw wi wildness, I saw wildness in that moth. You know, that's the kind of thing you have to train yourself to see. And then, you, and what you learn from those experiences is your position in the world. And it, you know, so you're not going there therapeutically, you're in it. That this is what it's all about, like this. So, uh, Anything else? Be glad to range around here. Or other topics that I uh, this suggested. Yes. What What in the end do you think? Of, this is a little off track, perhaps, but uh, you're such a scholar of the world, you probably have an answer to it. What do you think of, of his uh, view of uh, human nature? Uh, what did he think of people when you look at the whole uh, corpus? Well, I think he, I think he was basically fairly disappointed <laughs> in human nature. Um, you know, the other thing that we all have to remember is that late in life, and I've written about this in, in my most recent book, late in life he became a very a fervent abolitionist and a strong supporter of John Brown, really the first one in the country to praise John Brown and to kind of make him into some kind of martyr. Other people were condemning him as a madman, and Thoreau's eulogy for him was kind of reprinted in many national papers. So, uh, you know, he, he understood that he didn't drop out all the way, let's put it that way. He understood finally that there was a need for social action and social improvement at some point. Again, this happened later in his life, and that's in the late 1850s. So the Walden period I always see as a kind of 
the phrase we used to use, he was getting himself together. <laughs> you know, he, he was going there, as you know, he only went for two years, two months, and two days. That's, that's exactly the length. And he didn't have to leave. It was Emerson's land. He could have stayed there as long as he wanted. But he said, uh, memorably, I had more lives to live. You didn't want to spend more time on that one. Uh, and so that's when he re-enters society and becomes, again, more part of the town, more part of the town of Concord. He lived with his parents, he worked with his father in, a, in his pencil factory, these sorts of things. Um, so, you know, again, I think he, um, he was disappointed by people's uh, economic rapacity, but, you know, he loved to hang out with children. He loved to hang out with the ne'er-do-wells, those who weren't committed to any kind of labor uh, in factories, this sort of thing. He thought that that life was dehumanizing. Um, remember, this is a period when, if you ask someone in, in 1820, uh, what's your job? You know, very few people would understand that the way we do. In other words, that there was one thing that you did. Thor, you know, what do you work at would be more apt. You know, if you were a farmer, if you were, if you were a minister, you still had your own garden, you still had cattle, you had to take care of these things. It was becoming a time when there was just a, a movement toward having one position, one job. And he thought that was, I think, very disappointing. It pulled away people from uh, understanding more about the natural world, the kinds of things he knew by his very varied work. He was a surveyor, he was a carpenter, he was a pencil maker. He did all these things in a sense like some 30 or 40 years earlier. The sad thing, of course, is that the, the Industrial Revolution was not going to be stopped by that point. It, it was already in full steam. Uh, you, you had a job, you got a wage, you bought food, you bought clothes, you went to stores. You didn't have to produce them any longer. But in doing so, he began to see how that leads into a, a, an ethic of accumulation, of excess. And I think that's what disappointed him very much by, by humanity. But I always stress the fact, you know, he was not a person who didn't care. He cared a lot about slavery uh, and, and fighting it, of course. Um, and that's, uh, that's significant. So, yes? Well, with the context, but could you just expound upon the phrase, what are men selling? Do you remember that from the mm -hmm. Remind me. That men are always on a committee planning something. Uh, they're always striving to set up the next parade. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, one thing about him and many of the transcendentalists, in fact, is that they continued to, to insist that the, the answer to the age's problems uh, lay in the, in the um, reform of the individual of the person. And, he, and if he, what he disliked were things like temperance meetings or sewing societies or things like this. First, the conscience had to be changed. That was the important thing. And then there would be a kind of replication of that in other people. So he didn't like uh, reform by that kind of organizational uh, uh, fiat. But as I'm suggesting, you know, toward the end, again, with, with slavery, he certainly contributed to Concord's anti-slavery movement. But this, this sense that we can solve a problem if we make a, a group come together together for this. No, that's, that's not what he believed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank Very you. much fun. Thank, thank you. you. So, okay, much. great. <laughs>